Welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are going through the Gospel of John, verse by verse, and today we come to John chapter 4, verse 23. So I would encourage you to get your Bible if you can, open it up to John chapter 4, and we'll begin in just a minute after I tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Remember, you can study the whole Bible with me, verse by verse, using my audio Bible messages. I've got archives going back over 34 years. are all there. Four series going through the Bible, verse by verse, in-depth Bible study. You choose the series the book of the Bible, the section, the chapter, click and listen. So again, all you need to bring is your Bible and a hunger for God's word to the thebibleversebyverse.com. <clears throat> and Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. John 4, 23. Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. And they're alone. And it was really unusual for any person, any man in that society to talk to a woman, even in a crowd, let alone being alone. But Jesus was on a mission to tell her about salvation. She needed to be saved. And so he is discussing things with her. And we come to verse 23. Actually, let's begin in verse 21. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know, no, ye know not. Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Jesus says that Almighty God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. This reference to the Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit, which is working inside of us who are saved, which causes us to worship God from our heart. That's what it means to worship God in spirit. It comes from deep down inside of you. The Holy Spirit reveals truth and shows us, among other things, how we are to worship God as Christians. And gives us that desire to do so, too. We don't sacrifice animals as Christians in our worship to God because that's not what the Holy Spirit leads his people to do today. We do not do grain offerings like in the Old Testament, and we are not under the law to make a pilgrimage someplace in order to worship God. Instead, it's just a natural thing. For a Christian, someone who is saved, to worship Christ. The moment you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit in Christians stirs them to worship Jesus Christ. If you have no desire to praise God, no desire to worship God, and you don't have a deep felt love for the Lord Jesus Christ, then <clears throat> you can call yourself a Christian. But I wouldn't bet on it. 24. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worship God in spirit and in truth. Meaning, meaning this. You already saw what it means to worship God in spirit. Now he says also, you have to worship him in truth. Meaning, line your life up with the word of truth. With the written word of God. When you sin, which we all do, 
confess it, and move on because trying to worship God while living in sin is not worshiping God in truth. Your life has to line up with the written word of God and you have to confess all your sins. Then you are able to worship God in truth. Verse 26, for verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus is talking about some deep spiritual truths to this woman. And she's having a hard time grasping these truths. But then she says, she says she believes that when the Messiah comes, He's going to help her to understand. And then she will know. Then she will know. She's willing to put off her learning until the Messiah comes. So, 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. He's come. Jesus says, you don't have to wait any longer. You don't have to look any further not any further than me, because I am he. I am the Messiah. I have the answers. And Jesus does have all the answers. You don't need counseling. You don't need psychology. You don't need psychotherapy. You don't need two techniques. You don't need how-to books. You don't need any of that stuff. To know what to do, to know how to live, you need the written word of God and you need to be saved so that the spirit of Jesus is inside of you. Then you open the Bible, you read the Bible, and you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you. And there's nothing wrong with a, another Christian who is well-versed, been a Christian longer than you, knows more about the word of God than you do. There's nothing wrong with somebody like that coming along and helping to disciple you. And to teach you, that's fine. That's that's biblical. But that's that's as far as counseling should go. True biblical counseling is one Christian who is mature in their faith and knows the Word of God coming alongside a younger Christian, younger in time being a Christian, that is, and just discipling them, helping them to understand the Word of God. That's Christian counseling. That's true Christian counseling, not psychobabble, not going to college, getting a degree, and then talking like Freud or like any secular counselor, except where you, you just sprinkle a couple of Bible verses taken out of context on top of it to make it palatable to professing Christians. That's just a bunch of baloney, and it leads people astray. I've seen it countless times because they say things because their emphasis is on theories and techniques and psychological principles, it leads people away from the pure word of God because many of the things that they say are contrary to Scripture. You don't need that. Jesus has the answer. He always has had all the answers. He still has all the answers today. And that's what he's saying to this woman. I've got the answers. I'm him. 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with this woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? It was, uh, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, <clears throat> it actually was a religious rule back in those days that a rabbi could not speak to a woman in public it was, it was a religious rule as well as a social rule of the day. Well, Jesus ignored that rule because it was more important to him to save this woman's soul. His disciples were shocked, though, to see him talking with a woman, but none of them dare ask him, why are you doing it? Because they had complete and total confidence and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. 28. The woman then left her water pot. Remember, they're talking at a well. She came to do what women normally did every day, and that was to get water. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, stop there for a second, just hold it for a minute. 
Notice how she left the water jar and then went into the city. Even though that water had meant a lot to her. Oh, you better believe it. Jesus tried to talk, tried to talk to her about spiritual water. In other words, eternal life. But all she could think about was literal water. So suddenly, though, after talking to Jesus and better him talking to her, suddenly she leaves that precious water pot and goes into the city. The water was very important earlier. But now it doesn't mean anything to her. She leaves it. And it's because she has met the Son of God. And now everything else seems to be pretty small. And that's the way it is. You know, when you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, the, the things of this world, I'm not going to say they all become meaningless, but they are so far down the list of important things that oftentimes the things that the world thinks are so very important are meaningless. And they may have once had great meaning for, for you. But when you came to Christ, it's like, hmm, just don't mean, they don't mean that much anymore, if anything. Seemed kind of small. Verse 29. The woman goes into town, and interesting, she says to the men, okay, come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Jesus knew everything that this woman ever did. And she knows it. She knows that Jesus knows everything that she has ever done. And Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, knows everything that you and I have ever done, have ever thought about doing, have ever desired to do, have ever said. He knows it all. And he also knows, he also knows what we wanted to do, but we could not or did not do, or he knows everything that we maybe wanted to say, but we did not say it. He knows all this. And the wonderful thing is, in spite of the fact that he knows everything that you and I have ever done or wanted to do or thought about doing or said, he still loves us. He still, he still wants us to be with him. He still died on the cross to pay for our sins. He still wants to have fellowship with us if we will only turn to him. He knew all about this woman. She did not live a very good life. She was married five times and she's now living with a guy. There's something wrong with that woman, morally speaking. Perhaps that's why she went and told the men. Probably the women in the city probably didn't have anything to do with her. They probably didn't trust her. But anyway, look at verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. The woman went into the city and told these townspeople, the men anyway, about Jesus and what he said to her. They then went out to see Jesus for themselves. And it is so very important. Don't overlook this principle. It is so very important for people to check out Christ and the word of God for themselves. No one can live off the faith from someone else. If you don't have the interest, or somebody doesn't have the interest to study the Bible or read the Bible themselves or to pursue the knowledge of God's word themselves, if they don't have the interest, chances are the Holy Spirit's not leading him or drawing them. And if he's not drawing them, it's because they're not interested and they're in trouble. One thing we can do for people like that is pray that God gives them a hunger for truth. And I'm out of time. If you would like to be a part of this ministry and get out the word of God with me, you know I give it out straight and I've been doing it for over 35 years and the whole counsel of God, not leaving anything out or watering it down. Then pray for me, pray for God's word. 
Go to the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. I will see you next time right here.